Owen, we're live. Sergeant Polite, can you start the cloud? According to the cloud, all set. Sergeant Bradley, can you give the opening, please? Yes, sir. Okay, good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Environmental Protection. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize the disruption, please place electronic devices or vibrate or in silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We may begin, Chair. Okay, great. All right. Um, good morning and welcome. Uh, I am Councilmember Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and today's oversight hearing is on climate change and environmental quality, a public health issue. We will also hear intro 2149, a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to climate indicators, and resolution 1469, calling on nations around the world to implement the United States Senate to approve and the president to ratify a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. New York City is experiencing firsthand the devastating impacts of climate change and climate disruption. We just concluded the tropical storm season with a record breaking 30 named storms and 12 land falling storms in the continental United States. While the official, official hurricane season concludes on November 30th, tropical storms may continue to develop past that day. More than anything, we need efficient monitoring and evaluation of climate indicators of climate change. In order to undertake efficient monitoring and evaluation, we need an organized and manageable set of climate indicators and resiliency practices and measures. Currently, there are the more than 30 scientific organizations and agencies monitoring climate and climate resiliency in the New York area. These organizations range from, the, range from the Hudson River Environmental Conditions Observing System to the National Science Foundation's Long-Term Ecological Research Network to NOAA's Atmospheric Administration Historic Climatology. We have not integrated our water quality data from DEP, DEC, and USGS. We have developed biodiversity indicators to support the Global Convention on Biodiversity that includes metrics for wild bird population trends and the aerial extent of wetlands and marine grasses. We need to integrate our remote sensing data developed by New York City DOIT. Finally, we need algorithms to standardize these set, different set data sets. Currently, these and other agencies and organizations are undertaking monitoring work, but their data streams are not integrated and therefore cannot consistently or appropriately be funded or used to predict uh, impacts upon the most vulnerable communities. Uh, proposed intro 2149 creates a climate resiliency indicator and monitoring working group to pull together necessary data in a single location and their creation of two climate indicator pilots, one of which will address equity and social vulnerability and the other will address climate uh, resiliency indicators and metrics. According to New York City Panel on Climate Change, Existing indicators and monitoring systems should be adapted to provide targeted information on climate resiliency. We need a, a comprehensive, adequately funded, multi-jurisdictional multi indicator and monitoring assessment to enhance the scope and resiliency of our climate efforts. We are also going to hear resolution 1469, calling on nations around the world to implement the United States Senate to approve and the president to ratify a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. According to US Energy Information Administration, OPEC and fossil fuel companies face declining fortunes for fossil fuel companies despite continued growth. For example, OPEC concluded that its member needs to pump between 600,000 and 2.2 million fewer barrels a day through 2021 than was thought necessary just a few months ago to meet global demand. While scientists insist the world must reduce usage by 6% a year, every year, until 2030 to avert catastrophic temperature increases. A fossil fuel proliferating treaty has three pillars. 
and the expansion of new reserves of coal, oil, and natural gas to limit carbon emissions, phase out current stockpiles to keep carbon underground and out of the atmosphere, and lastly, promote economic diversification, renewable energy, and other low carbon solutions in a way that leaves no workers, communities, or countries behind. We have no alternative but to get behind a sustainable future with continued, uh, we, we, we have no alternative to get to a sustainable future. Uh, this treaty commitment should represent the way to the future for everyone. Before I begin, I would like to thank my committee staff, uh, our committee counsel, Samara Swanston, policy analyst, Nadia Johnson and Nick, Ricky Chalwa, uh, financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, uh, my legislative director and, and uh, legislative counsel, Nicholas Wazowski, for all of their hard work. And now we'll hear from the administration and Samara will administer the, uh, the oath. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Um, to begin with, as a moderator, I have to remind everyone that you're going to be on mute until you're called on to testify when you'll be unmuted. Um, I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Uh, be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. Wait and listen for your name to be called. I'll be periodically announcing who the panelists will be. We'll begin with testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from the members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raised hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and now, um, I'd like to deliver the oath of administration and uh, we will, the administration will be represented by Mark Chambers and Janie Babishi. So Mark Chambers, I don't see him. I'm here, see me? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, Mark, <clears throat> do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And uh, Janie, uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Uh, thank you. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can hear me well. Good morning, Chair Constantinides and members of the Committee on Environmental Protection. My name is Mark Chambers and I am the Director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I am joined today by my colleague, Janie Bavishi, the Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the urgent work of sustainability, climate and our public health and the indicators that help us track progress as addressed in intro 2149. Climate change is upon us and it is lethal. We know this. The results of our addiction to fossil fuels continue to be felt in both our natural world and our natural bodies. We just exited the hottest November on record in what will likely go down as the hottest year on record. And it's not just the scorching heat waves or larger coastal storms that threaten us, but also the ways in which our urban systems and built environment struggle to react to these changes. Here's an example. Despite an overall downward trend, in 2018, like many other cities and states, New York saw an, a troubling increase in our greenhouse gas emissions, as reported in our annual greenhouse gas inventory. That year, we saw an increase in the number of extremely hot days, or an increase uh, in what we call cooling degree days by 18%, which results in an increased demand for electricity to power air conditioning. Months later, in the same year, there was an increase in number of cold days, about a 13% increase in what we call heating degree days. <clears throat> which is caused, which basically caused an increase in energy demand for heating systems. So what is particularly concerning and what I think is particularly important for New Yorkers to understand is that the time of year when we see these increases matters. You know, many electric generating units switch to fuel oil in the winter to preserve our gas supply uh, for heating on these extremely cool days. That means that the carbon intensity of the grid gets worse. 
And in 2018, the time I'm describing, it was 7% more carbon intensive than it was the previous year. And our air gets dirtier too as a result. Now, this committee knows uh, and the health of New Yorkers, it's impacted by the fossil fuel systems on which we currently depend. We know that burning fossil fuels in our buildings and in our cars and in our buses increases air pollution and makes it harder for New Yorkers to breathe. The link between exposure to particulate matter pollution, for example, and increased risk of death due to COVID-19 is now well established. That is why the de Blasio administration has been and remains committed to addressing the underlying systemic social inequalities and inequities and health disparities exacerbated by climate change. And our work to do so becomes more urgent every single day. Our office's long-term climate planning and sustainability work to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 is critical to the public health of New Yorkers. As we've shared with you before, we distributed 74,000 air conditioners to low-income seniors this summer through the Get Cool NYC program, responding to the need to protect our most vulnerable seniors from heat waves and, and from COVID-19. Our work to reduce fossil fuels in buildings also generates air quality and health benefits. In 2019, for the first time, there was no reported sales of fuel oil number six, demonstrating a complete phase out of this dirty fuel for the first time due to the clean heat program. This change has resulted in a 95% decrease in sulfur dioxide or SO2 levels in neighborhoods across the city as measured by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Community Air Survey. As buildings work to meet the requirements of Local Law 97 and to reduce their reliance on fossil fuels for heating, air quality inside those buildings and outside those buildings will continue to improve. Our agency partners continue to make good progress on implementing these laws like Local Law 97. And we enc we're encouraged by last month's passage of intro 1947, which will ensure that more tenants in some rent regulated buildings will be able to reap the benefits of building retrofits. We still have a lot of work to do to reach our carbon reduction goals. And we are prioritizing this work with the health of our most vulnerable communities top of mind. We continue to need to connect offshore wind and other large scale renewable resources directly into New York City's power grid to allow us to reduce the need for in-city fossil generation and to make sure our increasingly electrified buildings run on clean electricity. As we transition away from fossil fuels for heating and power generation, utilities will no longer be able to justify building new fossil fuel infrastructure like National Grid's MRI pipeline through New York City's neighborhoods. We also need to continue our work on transportation, especially as New Yorkers transportation patterns change due to the pandemic. We must make sure that our public transit system remains reliable, accessible, and clean. And we need to ensure that people can move around the city in safe, low carbon ways. We look forward to congestion pricing's implementation to continue support the MTA. Our office has prioritized the expansion of charging infrastructure to support electric vehicles and buses, but we will need to work with all of our partners across the city, state, and federal government to truly build the infrastructure we need. Our office is also in the process of completing several studies to inform the work on carbon reductions in ways that prioritize public health. In collaboration with our local utilities, we are nearing the completion of a first of its kind study to determine pathways to decarbonize New York City's electricity grid. And we look forward to sharing the outcomes of those study with the council in 2021. We will continue to center health outcomes especially in our most historically burdened communities as we plan to prioritize future policy and programs. Our office looks forward to our continued work together with council to meet this crisis head on with innovative solutions, data-driven action and fierce urgency to provide a livable future for all New Yorkers. And with that, I will now turn to my colleague, Director Bavishi, who will provide testimony on intro 2149. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Good morning. I'm Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I would like to thank Chair Konstantinidis and Council Members Ulrich, Levin, Menchaca, and Yeager for the opportunity to testify today. As we adapt New York City to the impacts of the climate crisis, we strive to track our actions and transparently communicate climate impacts and our progress to local st stakeholders and the public at large. 
Increasing the resiliency of such a dense, populous, and geographically varied city is a Herculean task that will take decades. These resiliency efforts are critical to safeguarding public health, supporting lives and livelihoods, and protecting critical infrastructure, housing, and our natural environment. As you may know, the city already monitors many key metrics, such as the acreage of restored wetlands, the square footage of rooftops that have been coded through the Cool Roofs NYC program, and the number of small businesses that have increased the resiliency of their facilities and operations with the help of post-Sandy programs like Business Prep. Additionally, we constantly monitor the progress of our many ongoing resiliency projects, from massive efforts like the six mile long Rockways Atlantic Shorefront project to smaller but no less important efforts like installing thousands of curbside rain gardens. This information is sourced from all across the city government, since nearly every city agency is involved in, a cl in climate adaptation to some degree. Other key resiliency related metrics are tracked by external parties in New York City, such as Cotton Edison, as well as federal agencies like the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. I would also like to highlight how the city has taken significant steps recently to uplift science and increase the public's understanding of climate hazards and the risks we face we will face into the future. Earlier this year, we proudly announced the fourth New York City Panel on Climate Change, which is the most diverse, credentialed, and multidisciplinary panel yet. To support their work and strengthen our commitment to the science-based to science-based policymaking, we also recently hired our first in-house climate science advisor to develop a climate science and risk communications program. Right now, our climate science and risk communications team is working with the NPCC, city agencies, external partners, and community-based organizations to perform a comprehensive assessment of climate knowledge gaps and community needs. This comprehensive input will form the basis of the city's first ever climate research agenda and shape the plan for NPCC's fourth assessment cycle. Even as we develop this formal climate research agenda, our office has been strategically pursuing opportunities to fund data collection. In July, MOR and the Office of the Chief Technology Officer won a $90,000 grant to co-develop a real-time flood sensor monitoring system in Gowanus, Hamilton Beach, and Howard Beach. This builds on our work developing FloodWatch, a sunny, day, a sunny day flooding program to monitor chronic local flooding with our community and agency partners. We agree that more can and should be done to monitor the city's progress as it relates to climate adaptation and resilience. Likewise, we agree that monitoring and evaluation related to climate change impacts must be communicated to the public in a clear, regular, and transparent way, with an emphasis on public health, environmental justice, and social vulnerability. For these reasons, the Mayor's Office supports the intention of Intro 2149. We look forward to working with Council on a cost-effective way to pursue these objectives and look forward to directly providing feedback and recommendations. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Committee on Environmental Protection for allowing the administration to testify here today. We look forward to your questions. Mark, Cheney, thank you both for your testimony. It's good to see you both, even if it's virtual. Um, I wanna make sure that I recognize two of my colleagues who have joined the committee hearing today, uh, Councilmember Menchaca and Councilmember Yeager, both from Brooklyn. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna begin my questions. Uh, what New York City educational institutions are monitoring climate currently? There we go. I took a little bit to unmute there. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, um, so there are definitely um, multiple uh, uh, Entities in academia that are that are constantly uh, kind of working with the city uh, to monitor. I think uh, NYU and CUNY, CUNY are um, two very significant institutions that are uh, working significantly with the city on on this. Uh, but I'll also pass this to uh, to my colleague um, uh, Director Bavishi, who may want to kind of talk more specifically around the the monitoring questions in Intro Twenty One Forty Nine. Um, sure, I'm happy to. Um, so, uh, Chair, thank you for the for the question. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my testimony, we work with the the New York City Panel on Climate Change, and the panel represents a range of academic institutions, um, both inside the city and and in the metropolitan area. Um, you know, that that work to uh, monitor climate in different ways and um, and and provide important research and science that uh, really serves as a foundation for their resiliency program. Um, just a, a, a sampling of some of the institutions that are involved um, on the panel are uh, Columbia University, the New School, um, uh, Rutgers, um, and, and the list goes on. Um, you know, 
I, I should also say that monitoring climate um, can mean very many different things. We're working beyond um, our partners in academia and really working with community to also monitor climate impacts. And I mentioned the Flood Watch program in my testimony. Um, this is a, a great example of how we're really employing community science, resident science, to understand the impacts of sunny day flooding in, in communities. Um, so, you know, our, our work to, to monitor climate um, uh, involves many partners. Um, it involves city agencies, it involves academia, it involves federal agencies, our private sector partners like Con Ed, as well as our communities. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so do you, how are we currently monitoring biodiversity? I'm unmuted, there we go. So biodiversity, again, um, relates in, in a lot of different um, uh, different components that, that tie directly to a lot of work that's happening both uh, within our offices as well as the uh, Parks Department, as well as planning, um, as well as uh, Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, what we try to do is to be able to look at the, uh, the holistic impact of biodiversity across uh, all the spectrum of, of all agencies. So um, I, tree canopy is a perfect example of this. Parks is a um, great example of being able to uh, analyze where exactly that those tree canopy components are, are being monitored and using geo tracking to be able to display that information to the um, uh, to residents of the city. DP also monitors uh, the water quality associated with, with biodiversity. So there's a handful of different places in which those are tracked. All of those contribute towards um, the um, the information flow that goes to to residents as well as to city partners around uh, various forms of biodiversity. Have any of the biodiversity indicators been developed in support of the Global Convention on Biological Diversity or consistent with any other ecological principles? Unmute. Yes, short answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, how are we monitoring social vulnerability uh, currently? Sure. So um, I, I actually will actually turn this to um, Director Bavici to talk about uh, social vulnerability. But one thing that we will uh, also want to highlight is how that relates to our heat vulnerability index, which I think is a very good example of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the heat vulnerability index is a great example of how we're monitoring social vulnerability and how we're taking social vulnerability indicators into account um, in our heat resiliency work. Um, so the, the index, um, which was developed in partnership between Columbia and um, uh, uh, the Department of uh, Health and um, the, the city's Department of Health, um, uh, really uh, overlays physical indicators of heat risk, things like um, density in communities and the lack of vegetation um, or green space and with um, social indicators of heat risk, um, you know, things like race and poverty. Um, and so we, we um, have overlaid those, those different layers to really understand which populations in the city are the most vulnerable to uh, the impacts of extreme heat in the city. And that data really drives and informs uh, where our investments are made um, in terms of supporting communities to build resiliency to extreme heat. So I mean, just to give an example, we, I know we're doing white roofs for a number of years throughout the city. How is the city monitoring the progress of that program? I'm so glad you asked that question. That's a great example of how we're making sure the environmental benefits that we're developing through our resiliency investments are actually going to the places that are most vulnerable. So, you know, we've we've coded over 10 million square feet of rooftops um, over the last 10 years. Um, since we've had this <coughs> vulnerability index for the last several years, we have really been trying to target those roof coatings in the most heat vulnerable areas. Um, and so we, we continue to uh, use that data to drive where we are delivering these environmental benefits um, and want to make sure that we're, we're taking both social risks as well as physical risks into account. And we're I'd also like to add that it. No, go Mark, go ahead. It, it, sure, it, it, it builds upon that, right? And so it's the, the important thing is to know is that there are consistent layers that go on top of that that allow for us to, uh, to target these same areas with additional benefits. We're, you know, we're currently working on a green roof tax abatement uh, that would allow for uh, areas that use similar um, social vulnerability as well as uh, heat vulnerability and 
components to be able to benefit from increased um, uh, um, tax abatements uh, for installing green roofs. So those would have a positive impact on the uh, localized heat island, have a positive impact on the uh, stormwater retention, and would also be able to uh, contribute towards these health indicators, which we're also tracking. So I, I want to just make sure the point is clear that uh, each of these things is not a standalone. Part of the work that is important for our offices is that a constant um, building and overlap and overlaying of different initiatives and efforts that allow for uh, the most benefit from most New Yorkers. And I assume also we're I might even build on that because I think this really underscores um, how uh, MOR and MOS coordinate to deliver these benefits, right? So, I, I, so in addition to what Mark said, in addition to the cool roofs, um, we are also targeting street tree plantings in these same neighborhoods. And we're also pairing these retrofits to our physical environment with, um, with, with programmatic investments, things like um, investments in community-based organizations in these same areas to um, to advance the Be a Buddy program, which pairs uh, volunteers with the most vulnerable residents of these communities so that we're, we're checking in on them. It, it's just based on the basic tenet of neighbors helping neighbors, so that we're checking the, in on them in extremely hot days and checking in on them during other disruptive events like the pandemic. Um, we've, we're also training home health aides um, to check in on their, uh, their patients um, as they're making their regular rounds um, so that they're detecting early signs of heat illness. Um, it really goes to show, you know, that that we need to, to uh, invest in our physical environment, but also pair those investments with programmatic um, interventions that can that can help to keep people safe. Just to kind of, so you guys have built on these, these questions. Now I'm going to ask, I have a question that sort of builds on that, right? Is do we have some sort of map that shows to the public, right, where are we making these investments, you know, where are these pairings are happening, where we've painted those white roofs, where are we still have opportunity to do more, have we put together some sort of publicly available document that either, you know, that the council can see if we can put online and say, look, these are all, this is all the work that we've done so far on white roofs, on, you know, on street tree plantings and, and rain gardens, here's how we paired them together, here's what we still opportunities, like, do we have that data sort of neighborhood by neighborhood available, especially for uh, EJ communities who are you know, very vulnerable? Yes, um, the, I think one of the, the ways in which uh, we constantly are updating and providing that information to the public is through your, our annualized 1NYC uh, progress reports, which shows uh, the layering of, of some of the questions you've, you've asked. Now, I want to also point out that there are also specific um, tools that have been developed that tailor specifically to a lot of the questions that, that you're asking. Um, you know, there are tools available that showcase the, the city's geothermal potential, for example, where any New Yorker can look at any block where they live and find out whether or not that area is well suited for geothermal. There are tools available for New Yorkers to look and see whether or not their neighborhood is well suited for different types of renewable energy. It's called a community energy planning tool. Um, and a lot of this has come out of, uh, of the work that we've done with, with Council, Local Law 64, and several others. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, they're, they're available. I think there's always room to create better tools and better products for people to be able to understand and digest the information more clearly and have them co-located in one place. And how are we integrating like Local Law 97 implementation into this, right? How are, we, you know, are, are green roofs or retrofits for buildings, city-owned buildings in particular, how are we then you know, sort of layering that on top of the work that we've already done in those same communities to help alleviate these, these challenges in those neighborhoods. Absolutely. So there, there's a lot of great data stories to kind of tell that help us to kind of, to kind of do that. And I think that um, as we start to unpack and plan out the, the, the process which Local Law 97 has, has laid out, we are, we are investing in coming up with different ways in which we're going to communicate that. One of the, the tasks that the Local Law 97 <coughs> board and, and the kind of community supporting this has, has undertaken is to find out some of the best ways to communicate some of that information. Uh, as we are gonna start to get data in from from uh, from buildings that are in compliance, we obviously we absolutely want that information to be readily available and to make sure that um, New Yorkers can really see what they need to do next based on their compliance. We've already provided tools that give an estimate of any particular building in the city and what they would 
um, likely need to do to comply, um, and we can provide those resources. Um, but I, I, like I said before, we we want to increase that, and I think one of the the outputs is that we're looking to have tools that allow for anyone to be able to have a better estimate of not only where they can receive resources to help them do the retrofits, but what kind of retrofits are best suited for their particular program. And one other point that I'll make on that is that's also the the rationale behind the the um, uh, expansion of the New York City Accelerator. The Accelerator is a is a significant um, uh, effort undertaken by by our office to provide free technical assistance to building owners. Um, it, the the mayor has tripled it in size to meet the kind of moment and challenge of local on ninety seven. Um, and as it stands right now, New Yorkers that are looking for help and compliance can go to the New York City Accelerator. Um, ask questions, they will connect them to resources, connect them to financing opportunities, handhold them, meet them where they are to be able to start this work that's necessary. But again, more will come and I think better tools for everyone, digital tools will be a, a significant help in that. All right, I definitely wanna hear at some point, you know, I don't wanna make this into a local law 97 compliance hearing. So I, I will, uh, I definitely wanna hear what we're doing on sort of our end, right? Cause the city has a very ambitious goal that we have to meet. That I'm concerned that, you know, we only have four more years to comply, and you know, with the financial constraints of COVID, um, I want to make sure that we're still going to hit our goals. Uh, so I, I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor this point, but I do want to sort of put that on the record that we I definitely want to hear more about how we're going to meet these challenges based on the financial challenges that we're in. Uh, but just quickly before I I don't know if any of my colleagues have any questions, but I'll just ask. You know, what if any uh, climate resiliency indicators has the administration already proposed? Sure, I'm happy as, to jump so good. in. And uh, then as quickly, Jenny, let me, let me throw this, this add on additionally. Um, if for those that they have been proposed, have they been subject to public input? Um, so, so we are um, monitoring various indicators. Um, uh, both from a vulnerabilities perspective as well as a resiliency perspective. So let me just um, uh, talk a bit about both. Um, you know, first of all, I just want to say that um, climate change is, is extremely cross-cutting. So um, data sources um, are collected by a diverse range of organizations, as I've been uh, as. as as I've said in my testimony and, and to a previous uh, res uh, in response to a previous question. So we are um, working with federal agencies like NOAA, USGS um, to uh, collect data related to, to weather and coastal flooding. Um, we are also, as I mentioned, um, working with academic institutions as well as um, community to also understand weather related impacts, um, especially on sunny day, sunny day flooding. Um, and, and I will also say that related to heat, we have um, set up a monitoring network, um, both indoors and outdoors to track um, heat related, um, just trends in, in, in uh, uh, temperature, um, especially over the summer, and again, in the most heat vulnerable neighborhoods as determined by our heat vulnerability index. Um, and then we're also working with, with organizations like Con Ed um, to collect data related to the electric grid. Um, and then I will say that we're also tracking um, many, many uh, indicators on the, the progress of our, um, our, our resiliency solutions and interventions. So, you know, things like cool roofs, things like business prep, where um, progress on our coastal uh, resiliency projects, we are um, uh, tracking those, those indicators and those are reported, as Mark said um, previously, um, in the 1NYC progress reports. And I'll just add a few more pieces to, to what we're reporting. Again, I mentioned before the greenhouse gas inventory, um, the electricity grid um, kind of uh, monitoring and, and kind of the energy mix, uh, electric vehicle share uh, um, of kind of new motor vehicles, um, trips that New Yorkers make, uh, walking, biking, mass transit, sustainable modes of transit, city pension fund uh, investment. Uh, I think um, Janie might've mentioned like uh, flood insurance policies. Um, curbside waste diversion rates, there, the, uh, there's a, um, a full gamut um, and a lot of those are reported in 1NYC um, regularly and, and others are um, reported in uh, other data portals. <clears throat> At this time, I'm gonna ask to see if any of my colleagues have any questions.
All right, so yes, I'll, I'll continue then with, uh, with my questions then. We, we talked a little bit about green rooms earlier. Um, so I just so quickly want to sort of, this, sort of wrap that up and then I'll, I'll let the administration. Oh, uh, I want to make sure I acknowledge Council Member Steve Lemon uh, from Brooklyn, who is here today as well. Thank you, Council Member Lemon, for being here. Uh, so just quickly wrapping up on sort of the green infrastructure. Does the administration have a policy a procedure for testing the efficacy of uh, green infrastructure resiliency projects, for example, the bioswale program? And if so, does they make it avail publicly uh, data available? If not, would you consider integrating this data into the resiliency indicator database? So, um, to, so yes to your, your question about there being uh, standards for judging the efficacy um, of, of different um, uh, um, green kind of infrastructure, particularly as it relates to kind of stormwater management through the Department of uh, Environmental Protection. Um, but I, I definitely think that there is improvement to your 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 um, point that that could be made to make sure that we are constantly improving and making sure that this data is really clearly articulated to to New Yorkers so they can understand how to view different um, green infrastructure that's put in place in their neighborhoods and understand whether or not they are performing well and have a consistent metric to to, to review against that. So we were, are happy to consider that, um, you know, improving the, the, the levels in which we, we report and also look at how those are evaluated. All right. Okay, so with uh, not saying any of my Steve, do you, Steve has a question. I see his hand raised, so I'll, I'll pass it over to Council Member Steve Levin. <laughs> Why take my time on, on schedule? My apologies. Time starts Thank now. You. Thank you, Chair. Um, I did want to ask about um, uh, green roofs and and how what's our progress been um, in in recent years on um, advancing the green roof program and how how is it comparing to other cities? I know I was part of a panel going back a few years now, maybe five years, um, you know, with uh, representatives from uh, DC and no, Toronto no and Philadelphia. No, 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 and no, no. their, um, yes. you know, their, their program was, uh, had, had a much higher uptake in terms of um, uh, the green roof program, tax yeah. incentives, or, um, you know, legislative oh. mandates. Um, can you speak a little bit about how um, how are we looking at that and, and what we could be doing better, really um, um, exploring, uh, adopting uh, other mechanisms that they're using in other cities? Absolutely. Uh, good morning to you, Council Member Levin. Um, I, you know, so first, again, I, you know, the Thank you for your question. Also, thank you for referencing um, the, the work that was done in D.C. As many know, I um, directed energy and sustainability in D.C. before I came here and so had a, a, a lot of work in investing in that program. Um, there are, you know, there's a lot of work that's happening in different cities that take advantage of their particular uh, dynamics and around um, stormwater management as well as around um, increasing the uh, the benefits that come along, the thermal benefits that come along from, from green roofs. Also, the green roof technology has increased over uh, the last few years uh, where you can have uh, kind of thinner, high performing uh, green roofs, which is great for the industry to expand. Here in New York City, we have taken kind of uh, two kind of components in, in, uh, or tactics to be able to, to expand them rapidly. A lot of this, uh, one of the First things is the the expansion and kind of passing of Local 92 and 94 last year with council's um, uh, guidance and help to be able to mandate that new construction, new roofs in New York City have to have either vegetated or solar as a component of, or both as a component of their, their structure. That um, was dramatically uh, increasing the amount of, um, of uh, permits that are being sought through through DOB um, to be able to increase the amount of, um, of green roofs. And we expect to have some reporting um, coming out in the, in the next year once we're about a year past when that law went into, into effect uh, because we, we are anticipating there being a significant uptick um, that will also give us more indications geographically around the city as to where there's been an uptick. Um, but there's a lot of desire for, for additional vegetation and a lot of benefits that come from that. Second thing, as I mentioned uh, previously, is that we are working to implement the green roof tax abatement, which is something that was passed from the state, which will um, 
uh, basically increase the amount of um, uh, tax abatement that you can get for installing a green roof in prioritized areas of the city. So that will allow for us to, um, to create an additional incentive to be able to expand the amount of green roofs that are, that are going in. All in all, um, the city is well suited for additional vegetated rooftop space to be utilized. Um, and we're kind of excited to be able to support um, both through technical and, um, education, as well as through kind of financial opportunities to, for people to expand and do much more uh, vegetated rooftop space. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, what was the the uh, tax abatement, uh, or the, um, what what was it was at five dollars a square foot before? Uh, what is it now? Right. So so for um so the five dollars square foot still stays, and then the um, the additional green roof tax abatement. There's a it's almost like an amplifier that will be in prioritized areas throughout the city. And if uh, if memory serves me correctly, I have to check the data. I think it's um, somewhere in the neighborhood of like thirteen to fifteen dollars a square foot that the okay. the additional zones will be able to have. Why only a few zones? Why not around the city? So the, the, the way in which the state law um, was passed, it, it wanted to be able to take advantage and say that there are certain areas that can benefit, um, uh, just to council member, um, to this point earlier, certain areas that can benefit more greatly um, that are particularly vulnerable in the city um, through social indicators, and as well as um, areas that are particularly suited for uh, benefits due to the, um, the CSO, the, the, com the combined sewer um, overflow area. So mm -hmm. basically some parts of the city if water retention happens, it's better for the city at large. So those areas should also be prioritized to help uh, with water quality. So those are the two state factors that kind of contribute to this. And so that's why um, the analysis has been done to be able Time to expired. have prioritized zones. Okay, but prioritize, uh, why, if I may chair, just why, why would it need to be, why would there need to be a prioritized zone? Like why not just um, have the whole city be a prioritized zone? Like in other words, like, it, I realize that there's um, there's some personnel, you know, and kind of, uh, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, bureaucratic uh, time and energy that has to go into doing this and so and processing applications. But um, and so I can understand there, you know, in that sense, prioritizing certain areas. But but the the difference between five and fifteen is is I mean, when I talked, I forget the, the uh, name of the gentleman that I was on this panel with from D.C. Um, uh, but, um, you know, spoke very convincingly of the fact that the, the DC abatement was, uh, $15, I think, um, which per square foot, which, which makes a huge difference. It makes it a viable thing to do. No, ab absolutely. I, I think that there is definitely increased. So one thing to keep in mind is that there is a ultimately limited pool presently of the total rebates that, that, that are that are applicable. So the the desire from the state legislation I was see. to make sure that those go to prioritized areas. I think if we expand that pool, then I think yeah. you're right. You want to expand the the geography as well. But okay, right now, okay. so it's a limited sure pool yeah. of rebate. Yes. That that's yep. okay. Um, so I would you know I would implore our state colleagues to expand the pool of rebate. I realize that there's it costs it ends up costing money. To the to the state, but you get a you know you get a, a huge return on investment uh, with with these green roofs, um, just in terms Absolutely. of its impact on on um, on our carbon footprint as a city. So, um, okay, I would love to talk with you more. I mean, I, I know in in um, I mean one way that they did it in um, I think in Toronto where they mandate it, or if you don't, basically if you don't do do some type of green roof, you have to pay into a fund um, as an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, so there it doesn't necessarily come out of, a, a, into, out of tax dollars, but it's actually, the onus is then put on the developer. So. Right, I, I mean, one of the points to kind of keep in mind is that I also feel like as we start to see the, uh, the implications and um, of uh, local on 1994 with a dramatic increase in, uh, in a lot of the installed green roof square footage, we may also mm -hmm. see significant impacts on the market that would bring costs down. So hopefully that will also um, uh, allow for there to be like much more, um, uh, much more consistency across the market and as well as like a larger breadth of coverage that would be great for the city to see. Awesome. Okay. Let's, I, I would love to have a follow-up conversation with you if that's okay. 
Happy to do so. Great. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Levin. All right. So with that, I will end questioning. Uh, are any of my colleagues have any other questions? Councilman Chaco, Yeager. All right. So with that, I'll, I'll end my questioning of the administration. I want to thank you for your all the work that you do. I hope that you and your families stay safe. And uh, I wish you all a very happy holiday season. Um, and, and again, you know, I'm hoping that we'll end 2020 in a much better way than 2020 has gone. So please, I, hope, I wish you all the safety and health of the world. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you for having us and wish you the best this season. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, and now we'll turn to our public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our, unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be called individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin setting your, the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant of Arms to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Public testimony will be limited to five minutes. <clears throat> I would now like to welcome Sonel Jessel, who is representing WEAC to testify, who will be followed by Heather Morgan, who is representing AECOM. Attendees can now hear you. Time starts now. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Chair Constantinides and everyone at the City Council um, and the other council members present, as well as the city agencies here. Thank you all for um, holding this hearing on the importance of climate data indicators and um, how we're addressing the climate crisis in New York City. Uh, my name is Donald Jessel. I am the Policy Director at WEAC for Environmental Justice. Over the past 32 years, WEAC has been combating environmental racism in northern Manhattan, I myself have a master in public health from Columbia University. I'm here to discuss the potential of introduction 2149, the importance of tracking efforts related to climate change. Passing this bill provides a lot of opportunity for New York City. As a climate justice advocate who works with community, we use data from the city for public education and to understand what needs to be done to address the crisis. Often the city's open data is missing key information and or it's just really hard to find. And this information is really helpful to move forward our work. So for WEAC's Heat Health and Equity Initiative, for example, it's an initiative aiming to address extreme heat in Northern Manhattan. We created a number of public education materials to raise awareness and understanding about extreme heat and its impacts in our communities. It was difficult to find climate information such as the number of heat advisories the city issued in 2019, just as an example. And um, <clears throat> without a clear official number, we use temperature data, past notify NYC alerts, we scrambled to put together that number estimate. This is just one example of why having some clear, more clear indicators and data points would be really helpful for our work. Um, there's a lot of data that feels missing for public access, particularly about environmental justice neighborhoods. And so when collecting new items for reporting, we advise there be special attention taken to reporting those listed indicators for neighborhoods with environmental justice concerns. And we appreciate the chair that has already mentioned that and brought that to light. Um, too often we find that climate data is not given at the right spatial level to move our work forward. Micro level data, which could be data by block, would be extremely valuable for our resiliency, adaptation and mitigation planning especially in neighborhoods that have been under-resourced, formerly redlined, have disproportionate placement of industrial sites. We find that climate um, data points vary a lot by block, especially in these neighborhoods, because there's such a difference in tree coverage and pollution, um, things like that. Additionally, we're excited to have this, the indicator projects in this bill. It's important they're centered in environmental justice communities, prioritize data missing in those communities, and it's vital that environmental justice communities are represented in this working group that's also outlined. Um, <clears throat> lastly, it's important to continue work on climate justice in New York City and track its progress strictly. As we have already mentioned in this hearing, we were um, the one NYC progress report that showed the rate increasing is frustrating. Um, we understand that it's due to increased AC use, increased winter heating, that is very vital to ensuring residents stay safe and healthy in their homes. However, we think there's a lot that could be done to offset that increased use. 
Um, the mayor in February announced a, a plan around banning gas, new gas hookups. San Francisco has done it. Why has this not moved forward? That's something we're very interested in. Um, the Renewable Rikers Act, for example, we know the chair is really supportive of and a lot of other city council members are, and we want that to move forward as soon as possible. That's a really obvious um, source of renewable energy um, for our communities. Uh, furthermore, we, uh, we were increasing the use of ACs this summer with the Get Cool program, which was very vital. Um, but how come we didn't ensure big electricity sucking office buildings increase their temperatures inside while everyone was home to help reduce the, the energy use, for example, um, which the mayor has done in the past. We do look forward to continue with working with our partners on city council, the mayor's office, the other city agencies to answer all these questions and to explore a lot of options um, and to continue to push for major changes, some of which that have already been put into law, some of which are um, issues we wanna continue to move forward with. The COVID-19 crisis has made it even more clear that we need to ensure people are, people's homes are safe and healthy, a focus on retrofitting, electrifying, ultimately decarbonizing our household energy is vital to ensure that people have access to adequate energy that doesn't increase greenhouse gas emissions. That's why we act has launched our um, out of gas pilot project to prove moving away from gas stoves is healthy for our residents and our climate. We believe it's vital for the city to move forward with projects like this and expand it in a larger scale much more quickly. Um, so ultimately, we, we support the introduction. We think this is um, so vital for taking steps towards um, continuing to address the climate crisis. Um, but we believe there's much, much more that can be done much more quickly. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sonel. <clears throat> and uh, now I would like to welcome Heather Morgan to testify on behalf of AE. COM, who will be followed by Carlos Castell Cook on behalf of the New York League of Conservation Voters. Time starts now. Great. Hi, I'm Heather. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes? Good. All right. First, I would like to thank the members of the Committee on Environmental Protection, particularly Committee Chair Constantinas, for the opportunity to testify today in support of Introduction 2149, which establishes climate change and climate change resilience indicators, creates monitoring working group to integrate data and data sources and develops two climate change indicator pilot projects. My name is Heather Morgan and I oversee sustainability and risk management for ACOMS Metro North. I have nearly 20 years of experience in flood risk management, infrastructure planning, landscape architecture and landscape archeology span for projects focused on risk adaptation. I previously worked at the US Army Corps of Engineers, New York District, as well as headquarters under the Obama administration as a civil work sustainability lead and the national sustainability program manager helping to execute executive order 13693 with the Council of Environmental Quality. I worked on national strategies, policy development and the assessment of existing and proposed water resource projects to address urgent short and long-term risks. I have performed emergency operations for Hurricane Sandy, Irene, and Lee, as well as Joplin, Missouri's catastrophic EF5 rated tornado of 2011. I currently serve and have the privilege to serve as the Battery Park City Authority South Battery Park Resiliency Project lead. I'm the advise, an advisor to the North Battery Park Resiliency Project and previously was a design and community engagement lead for the Rebuild, Rebuild by Design Hudson River Project. The health of the natural, natural system is a national security concern. This is now our biggest commodity, is time, and our ability to be agile, nimble, inclusive, and quick is a requisite. Collectively through our society and governance, we are being thrust into having to apply a transdisciplinary approach for redefining the relationship between our human inhabitation and our natural system. We must take deliberate steps to holistically manage and merge the physical and governing boundaries of our complex urban communities and, our fa and face to, lay to face our layered risks. This bill is one of those must much needed steps. Transdisciplinary in Latin means across, over, and beyond, requiring an emergence of a new discipline that transcends the boundaries of discipline pr disciplinary perspectives. Climate change requires all of you as elected leaders to transcend the boundaries of your governing perspective and your communities. A transdisciplinary approach 
relates all dis disciplines into a coherent whole. That whole now being the ability to sustain ourselves and our quality of life. This bill advocates for all of us to establish new ways of creating indicators collectively, working groups, monitoring, and sharing data for that coherent whole. The natural system did not draw boundaries. We did. Floodwaters, heat index, wind, mortalities by drowning, viruses, and ecological degradation do not adhere to our transected boundaries of jurisdictions and property rights. The system that hosts us is adapting to find its new form of equilibrium, and we need to earnestly listen, watch, and try to measure through these indicators, working groups, and shared data as echoed in the conversations today. As you know, New York City is home to roughly 520 miles of coastal shoreline, with more residents living in high flood risk zones than any other US city. You also know that the 100 year storm event does not happen only once every 100 years anymore. And August 2020 was North America's hottest August on record. Projected future conditions and associated levels of uncertainty require that climate adaptation design must be robust, multi-layered and systemic. Interior drainage and urban stormwater drainage patterns, as well as coastal surge models are hinged to each other when we're considering what our new urban floodplain will look like. Why would we ask that our flood designs are integrated, robust, multi-layered and systemic solutions if we're not creating integrated, robust, multi-layered and systemic climate change indicators to track adaptation and resilience? If we're not comprehensively and cohesively monitoring the natural system that we're trying our best to respond to, if we're not doing what we can to cross-pollinate the data efficiently that we'll get from monitoring and working together while trying to understand a more coherent whole for what is happening and how to best collectively respond to it. A resilient and sustainable landscape responds to multiple objectives of ecology, social, and economic health, while ensuring long-term success by designing for future preparedness. Time expired. Okay. Am I, can I continue at all or is I, am I off? I'm sorry. I just- Virginia, just wrap up, yes. Okay, yeah. Um, in short, we can do better, we can do this, and we can't do this without tracking our environment. I would like to end my testimony in a quote from the book Natural Capitalism by Paul Hawken about how shared information and design flow among, among bureaucratic silos could have prevented tragedy and in infrastructure. Optimizing components in isolation tends to pessimize the whole system. You can actually make a system less efficient while making each of its parts more efficient simply by not properly linking up those components. If we're not designed to work together with one another, we'll, they'll tend to work against one another. Thank you for your time today and the important opportunity to support, to support an imperative need, not only for us, but our future generations. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, and next we'll have Carlos Castell Crook on behalf of the League of Conservation Voters. Uh, and he will be followed by Nicole Hernandez Hammer of Uprose. Time start now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carlos Castell Crook, and I am the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank Chair Constantinides for holding this important hearing and for the opportunity to testify. As the years go by, we continue to see the worsening effects of climate change. Storms and natural disasters are more extreme, temperatures rise, amplifying the deadly heat waves in the summer and the shoreline inches further inland threatening our valuable properties and infrastructure. The only way that the city can effectively deal with these threats is through a multifaceted approach that tracks, mitigates, and prevents these worsening conditions. Intro 2149 intends to establish a climate resiliency indicator and monitoring working group to collect and convene data that is currently collected from multiple different sources. This data will be provided to the Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability and also requires them to develop two climate change indicator pilot programs. We strongly believe that comprehensive tracking and management of climate change indicators is paramount if we are to effectively fight this crisis. This bill will push us in the right direction by bringing data together that is currently scattered and charging the mayor's office in maintaining and sharing this data. 
A yearly report, report as described in the bill will provide advocates, government officials, and lawmakers with the tools they need to accurately assess the threat of climate change. Additionally, by establishing two pilot projects, the city will be able to collect important data on climate change and resiliency that is not well tracked or does not currently exist. We fully support the expansion of indicator tracking and the passage of this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. <clears throat> I would now like to welcome Nicole Hernandez Hammer of Uprose, whose testimony will be followed by Kate Bocourt of the Waterfront Alliance. Waterfront Alliance. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to submit my testimony today. My name is Nicole Hernandez Hammer. I'm a biologist with nearly two decades of work on climate change research in academia and nonprofits with a focus on sea level rise and sunny day flooding. I'm grateful to serve as a community environmental scientist for UPROSE. I'm testifying today on behalf of UPROSE. Founded in 1966 and located in Sunset Park, UPROSE is Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. We are intergenerational and Black Indigenous women of color led. We are working at the intersection of racial justice and climate change. Sunset Park is a frontline community of over 130,000 in Southwest Brooklyn that lives with many polluting infrastructures and a growing number of climate change impacts such as extreme heat. Sunset Park, along with many other environmental justice communities across New York City, are the hardest hit by the global COVID-19 pandemic due to the long-term exposure of high levels of air pollution. Exposure that coupled with socioeconomic disparities such as lack of access to healthcare, housing, and food security has caused extreme devastation in our communities. We need regulations and investments that support climate resilience and recovery, not only recovery from the pandemic itself, but recovery from inequitable regulatory processes and the systems that have allowed the pandemic and climate change to have such disproportionate impacts on frontline communities. As you know, climate change poses significant risks to New York City, including a growing number of extreme heat events, more powerful storms, and nuisance flooding related to sea level rise. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, many of these changes are already baked into the climate system for decades to come as a result of past greenhouse gas emissions. Understanding these impacts over time is essential, particularly in frontline communities and especially in Sunset Park, as it is home to New York's largest significant maritime industrial area. While research modes and methods designated for monitoring and tracking climate impacts and resiliency efforts are often siloed, the realization of these impacts uh, of climate change on the ground will not be. Climate change impacts will continue to occur in communities already burdened with poor air quality and economic disparities. Storms and heat events will have combined impacts that at this time are still not well understood, particularly at the local level. A just transition rooted in equity requires us to rethink how we monitor and track climate impacts and how resilience is defined. The proposed Climate Resiliency Indicator and Monitoring Working Group is a critical step in creating more robust climate adaptation and mitigation efforts. The proposed composition of the working group must center the needs and perspectives of frontline communities. This working group should include frontline community expertise explicitly, along with hydrologists, geologists, and other technical experts. Further, the use of a community-based participatory research model for data collection should be a key component of these efforts. This will allow for more connectivity between monitoring and tracking and the proposed equity-focused pilot project, and for easier dissemination of working group outputs and data to frontline community groups. I would like to thank the New York City Council for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to provide um, this testimony today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicole, for your testimony. <clears throat> and now I'd like to welcome Kate Bocourt of the Waterfront Alliance, whose testimony will be followed by Doug P. Smith, Director of Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability for the City of Vancouver, Canada. Time starts now. Thank you, Council. I would like to thank Chair Constantinides and council members Ulrich, Levin, Menchaca, and Jaeger for the opportunity to testify today. And also to many of my colleagues who had made great points and to which our, our organization very much agrees with uh, previous to, to my own testimony. 
Waterfront Alliance is a nonprofit civic organization and coalition of more than 1,100 organizations working to inspire and enable resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. We're also the convener of the Rise to Resilience Coalition, a coalition of 100 organizations fighting for climate resilience in the New York and New Jersey region, of which uh, a number of my colleagues are here today. We support the council members' intent in intro 2149 to develop climate indicators, identified previously as a need by the New York City Panel on Climate Change. As we've heard today, climate indicators can help us to both understand the impacts of climate change on our city, its residents, and our progress towards reaching goals. And that's critical to make sure of, of a public and transparent process. We encourage the council to consider this bill as part of a broader framework for addressing climate resiliency citywide beyond lower Manhattan. An analysis of climate indicators is one piece of a larger strategy that we, we look forward to advocating Has for in 2021. And uh, indicators are critical to understanding vulnerabilities and climate trends. And we must use this information to support government decision-making um, regarding how the city designs, maintains, monitors, and replaces assets and infrastructure, uh, invests, uh, resources in communities uh, in an equitable way. Um, and we encourage uh, the, the council to, to really thinking about that as it, as it develops these indicators further. Working with the Rise to Resilience Coalition, we will call on our council members in early 2021 20, to support this bill and others um, and, and make sure that we're thinking about this as a, as a package that ensures a transparent, just, equitable, and green approach to reducing the risks that we face from climate change. We think that building upon this bill and a couple others that the council introduced over this past year uh, is such a way to, to get there. And I would like to name Intro 1620, the council bill to establish a comprehensive resilience strategy, as well as obviously the subject of today's discussion, Intro 2149 and Intro 2092, a bill that would require resiliency design guidelines to be followed for all capital projects. Um, we'll also be calling on key budget items that build the resiliency of disinvested communities, including low-income tenants and homeowners. So we look forward to working with you and the rest of the council to develop this package into a successful resilience strategy that, that carries New York City on beyond this administration and to the next generations to come. So thank you for your time uh, and, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Kate. Uh, and now I'd like to call on Doug P. Smith, who is the Director of Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability for the City of Vancouver. And he will be followed by Carol Muffet, uh, who will be the final test, who will be the final person to offer testimony. Time starts now. Mr. Smith, I believe you're muted. All right, let's try this. Is that better? My apologies. Um, good morning, members of council. Um, I do support introduction 2146, establishing climate indicators. However, I'm actually here to speak to the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, resolution 1469. So would you prefer that I wait and speak to that issue when it comes up? No. No, now is the time to do so. Your, your, your call is a witness, please go ahead. Okay, I will proceed then, thank you. Uh, good morning, committee members, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Doug Smith, and I am the Director of Sustainability for the City of Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada. I'm here to encourage to, today to encourage New York City to adopt the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, Resolution 1469. Vancouver has a long history of working with New York City through many of our networks like the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. And we have borrowed many ideas from New York City. Most recently, our Building Energy Retrofit Program and our Fossil Fuel Divestment Initiative. I am hoping we can return the favor today uh, by encouraging New York City to adopt this treaty like Vancouver did on October 15th of this year. 
Vancouver, like New York City, is already seeing the impacts of climate change, including increased air pollution, floods, and deadly heat events, all impacting vulnerable communities more than others. Also, like New York, Vancouver has implemented significant policies and regulations to reduce the demand for fossil fuels. However, without equal action on the supply side, we will not be successful. Billions of dollars are being spent on new fossil fuel development that greatly exceed our planet's carbon budget, and national governments everywhere are permitting this development, knowing full well that we're either creating billions in stranded assets that taxpayers may have to bail out, or even worse, they have no real intention of hitting our climate targets. And while this declaration is focusing on national governments, it may also encourage more action locally to discourage the supply of fossil fuels. For example, in Vancouver, this declaration led to City Council directing staff to change our business licensing fees to encourage gas stations to add electric vehicle charging and to discourage selling only fossil fuels. This declaration is about asking other levels of government to act, and to some this may seem like a hollow gesture. However, cities have a long history in leading the way on many issues that eventually become state and national policy. I will finish with a quote from Margaret Mead uh, on why actions by local government and the people they represent are so important. Never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world. In fact, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Doug. And our final witness today is Carol Muffet. Carol, you can testify at this time. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Constantinides, members of the committee for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm Carol Muffet, president of the Center for International Environmental Law and a member of the steering committee for the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty. The Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty sends the simple incontrovertible message that we cannot end the climate crisis without eliminating the fossil fuels that are driving that crisis. To have any hope of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees C, humanity must cut its emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero emissions by 2050. Fossil fuels account for more than 75% of those emissions, including nearly 90% of the CO2 emitted globally. Were countries to burn only the oil, gas, and coal already economically developed, it would eliminate any hope of staying below 1.5 C and indeed push the world far beyond two degrees of warming. In a report released last month, the United Nations Environment Program concluded that limiting warming to 1.5 C requires the world to cut fossil fuel production by 6% every year from 2030, from 2020 to 2030, and accelerate the phase out from 2030 onward. But on our present trajectory, production of fossil fuels is actually increasing by 2% a year. According to UNEP's production gap report, the level of global fossil fuel production currently planned or projected is 50% greater than would be consistent with two degrees Celsius and more than twice what we can afford to burn in a 1.5 degree world. This fossil fuel production gap is putting the world on a trajectory for three degrees of warming or more, and a climate catastrophe almost unthinkable in its scale and its scope. As Hurricanes Sandy, Katrina, and Harvey show in the starkest terms, cities are on the front lines of the climate crisis, with the poorest, and most vulnerable populations at greatest risk. As city leaders, you understand the gravity and urgency of that crisis because you are responsible for putting the pieces and the lives back together when disasters strike. In 1979, faced with the ex existential threat of nuclear weapons, New York City took a stand and called on the US and other nations to end the escalating nuclear arm arms race that threatened humanity with nuclear annihilation. In doing so, New York inspired action by other cities across the country and around the world. New York has the opportunity and the urgent responsibility to show that same leadership today. In endorsing the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty, New York City can send a message to the United States 
into the world that the era of unchecked fossil fuel expansion must end and will end so that the era of real and rapid climate action can finally begin. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. At this time, I'd like to ask if there is anyone else who's registered to testify, but whose name I have not called. If so, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, seeing no raised hands, I now turn it over to Chair Constantinides for any closing remarks. Uh, again, I, I want to thank everyone who took the time to testify today. I want to thank all of my colleagues for attending the hearing. Uh, I want to make sure that I, I thank um, our committee council and our host today, Samara Swanston, for all her great work. Uh, Nadia Johnson and Ricky Chalwa, our uh, policy analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, our financial analyst, my legislative counsel, Nicholas Wazowski, uh, all the sergeants at arms that helped make this hearing happen, all of our tech uh, folks that make this work, uh, because as, as seamless as this, this went today, it would not be possible without everyone behind the scenes doing the work that they do. Uh, and this concludes our 2020 year. Uh, you know, this has been a definitely challenging year. We like mentioned in my opening, 30 named storms in 2020. Usually I'm very proud of my Greek heritage, but the fact that we had to go into the Greek alphabet uh, for storms names does concern me a great deal. And we, and we have much work to do. Um, so I wish everyone here a happy holiday season. Wish everyone here safety and health for the new year. Uh, and uh, you know, with that, I will uh, virtually gavel the committee hearing of this Environmental Protection Committee uh, closed and, and thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, for all of its great work. That's it.